Section 6.5, Exponential Growth and Decay Functions. This video will help you evaluate exponential functions, graph exponential functions, and evaluate natural exponential functions. Evaluate exponential functions. Many real life events that involve rapid increase or decrease, including population growth, disease epidemics, and radioactive decay can be modeled using exponential functions. Let's take a look at a definition now. Equations that contain a variable in the exponent are called exponential functions. So here is an exponential function, f of x equals b, and where b is some number, and then we're raising that to the x power, and notice x is our variable in this equation. So x is an exponent that can be any real number, and b is the base, and so b has to be greater than zero, and b cannot be equal to one. So we have those stipulations on there. So that, that is all exponential functions are kind of in that form. Now let's take a look at an example here. If we let b, this value right here as our base, equal 10, then our exponential function will look like this. f of x equals 10 to the x power. And you can see that the exponential functions can grow quickly. So here I have a graph of f of x to the 10x power. So notice as we start out small here, with very small values, or in fact negative values, we're getting very close to the x-axis here. But as we start to get bigger, we even get to 1, right? We're going to be all the way up to 10. 2, we would have 100. So if I'm looking at points here, if I put f of 1 in this equation, I would get 10 to the first power, which is equal to just 10. And then if I evaluate f of 2, that is 10 to the second power, which means 10 times 10, or 100. So you can see already when I put an x value of 2 in here, my function value, my f of x value, will be already up to 100. So you can see that exponential equations grow very quickly. Let's take a look at some examples here that will help you understand how to evaluate an exponential uh, function. So let's see. So it says calculate each value of f of x where f of x is 2 to the x power. So we want to evaluate here first just f of 3. So that would look like this then. 2 and when I put a 3 up in here for x, I'm going to have 2 to the third power, which means 2 times 2 times 2. Now we want to be careful not to add here. It's easy to add those 2's together, but I want to go 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 again is 8. All right, f of 0. So let's see, I would have then 2 to the 0 power. And now remember, anything raised, any number, regardless of what this base is, raised to the 0 power is just going to give us 1. All right, f of negative 2. So I'm going to have now 2 to the negative second power. Now this is something to remember as well. Remember, any time we have a negative exponent, this actually means we take a reciprocal of the base. So this is actually going to be 1 over 2 to the second power. That's how I remove the negative exponent, is move this whole thing down into the denominator here. So I'll have 1 over 2 squared, which is equal to 1 fourth. All right f of negative 7, so I'm going to have 2 to the negative 7th power. That means I'm going to take the reciprocal here, so 1 over 2 to the 7th power, and I'm going to need to calculate 2 to the 7th power. So on my calculator, um, I'm going to hit 2 and then either the hat button, or sorry, 2 and then the 2 and then the hat button to the 7th power, or in my case, 2 to the xy button to the 7th power. And that's going to give me 128. So 1 over 128 for f of negative 7. Go ahead now and pause your, your video player and answer practice question 2. All right, question 2. So our function here, g of x, is going to take 4, our base, to the exponent of x. So g of 8, that means I'm going to take 4 now to the 8th power. So in my calculator, I would hit 4 and either the hat button or the x to the y button to the eighth power and that is going to give me a very large number six five five three six so it looks like sixty five thousand five hundred and thirty six g to the negative four that means I would have four to the negative fourth power so that means I'm going to have one over four to the fourth power and that is going to give me one over sixty four g to the 0 power, that means I'm going to have 4 to the 0 power. Remember, anything raised to the 0 power is just 1. And then finally, g to the negative 20th. See, I'll give myself a little more room here. That's going to be 4 to the negative 20th power. So that looks like 4, or sorry, 1 over 4 to the 20th power. So I'm going to take 4 to the 20th power. 
and that's going to give me a very okay so that's going to give me a one and then my calculator says 1.09 Nine five one times ten to the negative twelfth, or sorry, times ten to the twelfth power. So that is a very small number. Um, if we were going to write that number out, sorry, that's a very large number down in the denominator. Large number in the denominator means when we divide one by a very large number, that the overall number is very small. That's what I was getting at there. So if I was to write that out, it'd be one over, and I'd need to move this decimal twelve places. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, one, two, three, four, five, just to get it to the end there. So one, zero, nine, nine, five, one. And then I would need, uh, that's five, so I would need seven more, seven zeros here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it looks like that. Uh, ten billion nine hundred ninety-five million. Oh no, that's ten trillion nine hundred ninety-five billion, one hundred million. In the denominator there. Okay, go ahead and pause your video player now and answer practice question three. Hit play when you're done. Question three: Just browsing. Business owners at the shopping mall would like you to take your time. Research has shown that the longer you look, the more you will spend. The exponential function g of x equals 42.2 times 1.56 to the x power models the average dollar spent g of x after x hours of time spent at the mall so calculate each value of g of x so first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate uh, the time we've spent here which is half an hour notice x is in hours here and so we're getting 0.5 so we're going to figure out how much money we'll spend at the mall if we just go to the mall for a half an hour so what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to put 42.2 times 1.56, and I'm going to take that now to the 0.5 power. So in my calculator, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put 1.56, and I'm going to take that to the power of 0.5. Then I'm going to hit equals. I've got this answer. I don't want to round this answer. I want to leave that answer just like it is, and then hit times 42.2. And so that will tell me then that in a half an hour on average, I can expect to spend $52.71. All right. Question B. Now I'm going to spend an hour at the mall. So I'm going to have 42.2, 1.56 to the first power. And so I'm going to take 1.56 to the first power. Well, that's just 1.56. So this is pretty easy. I'm going to take 1.56 times 42.2. And I'm going to get $65.00 and 83 cents all right now let's try it where we spend two hours at the mall to the second power so I'll go 1.56 take that to the second power get that answer leave that answer as it is and then hit times 42.2 and now I'm spending 102 uh, and 70 cents. Three hours. Take 1.56 to the third power times 42.2 and I'm going to spend on average $160 and 21 cents. So you can see as I spend more time at the wall, as I spend more time at the mall, this start is starting to grow exponentially here. You know, notice the difference here between 52 and 102 is about $50. But notice after spending three hours at the mall, now I'm going up almost $60. So the difference between half an hour and two hours was, was 50 bucks, but now between two hours and three hours, it's growing exponentially. Okay. Part E, what is the average difference in cost for spending four hours at the mall instead of just three hours at the mall? All right, so we need to calculate first G of four here to find four hours at the mall. 42.2.56 to the fourth power. Okay, so notice we're getting quite large now. After four hours, we spent 240 almost $250 there. 
So finding the difference here, the difference then between the third and fourth hour is $89.72. Again, you can see how that's growing exponentially. You know, between hours one and two, we're spending about forty dollars more. Between hours two and three, we're spending almost sixty. And then in the fourth hour, we're spending almost ninety dollars more than we would have spent staying that extra hour. Graph exponential functions. Let's take a look at some definitions. Exponential growth occurs when the exponential function in the exponential function when the base is bigger than one. So if I put a number in here that's larger than one, I'm gonna have exponential growth like this one down here. I put a base in of four and notice my equation now is starting out small and growing exponentially, growing very quickly. Now exponential decay, which means things are gonna get smaller, occurs if our base is between zero and one. So not including one and not including zero, but somewhere between zero and one, then I'm going to get exponential decay. And notice with exponential decay equation, like I have here, notice I put one fourth, which is between zero and one. If I put this into my equation, notice what happens now is I start out big and I start to decrease very quickly. So both exponential growth and exponential decay are used often to describe real life scenarios especially with population. So one thing to notice here too about these graphs is a horizontal asymptote is a horizontal line that tells you how a function will behave as the x value gets really big or really small. Both of the functions graphed above have horizontal asymptotes at y equals zero. This line kind of acts as a boundary on how small the f of x value gets as x values get really big or really small. So let's take a closer look at that here. I think I have a nice picture for you on this one. So notice this was our exponential decay equation kind of blown up. So remember our exponential decay equation was f of x equals 1 fourth to the x power. And so basically what's happening as our values, as our exponents get big here, this whole function gets small. And so what we're doing is we're getting really small, but notice we're never going to quite touch 0 or the x-axis here, where the function f of x is going to get really close but never equal to zero. And so what happens as we continue on here, this function gets really, really close to zero, but never quite touches it. It just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but will never actually touch, touch the x-axis there. All right, let's take a look at example four so you understand how to graph an exponential uh, growth or decay function. So example four, uh, g of x is uh, five to the x power. So since this base is bigger than 1, it's going to be an exponential growth. Okay, So we're going to have this thing grow. And so now we're going to graph this g of x equals 5 to the x power. So we're going to fill this small part in and this large part in after we get done filling in the numbers here. So let's see, if I put a negative 2 in there for g of x, I'll have g of negative 2 equals 5 to the negative second power. Well, that means 1 over 5 squared, or 1 25th. So a pretty small value there. So when our x value was negative 2, we are going to get 1 over 25 there. So negative 2 and up 1 25th, I'm just going to estimate that. Let's say that's right about there. Okay. Now when I put a negative 1 in there, g of negative 1, I'm going to get 5 to the negative first power, which means this, 1 fifth. So at negative 1, at negative 2, remember we had this point right there, negative they're going to have one-fifth, a little bit bigger. Uh, now when we do the zero power, I'm going to get one because, you know, five, five to the zero power is just going to be one. So I'm going to get a value of one here. We said this was a value of one-fifth. All right, now let's plug a value of one in here. So then I would have five to the first power. Well, five to the first power is just five. Now if I put a two in here, I'm going to have five to the second power which means I'm going to take 5 times 5, or 25. Now 5 to the third power, I'm going to get 5 times 5 times 5, which is 125. So let's go ahead and look at this graph here. So I started out with 1 25th, then I moved to 1 5th. Then at 0, I'm going to get 1. Then at 1, I'm going to get 5. So you can see I'm already starting to go off my graph, but you can see this exponential graph is going to 
take off this way since it's exponential growth. Now, if we continued on small here, we are gonna get really close to, but never ever touch zero. So we're gonna get really close to this x-axis, but never actually touch it. So up here, when x gets really small, g of x, the function here, is gonna get tiny or small, but never tiny, but never zero. When it gets really large, when I start putting exponents in really large, you can see this thing is gonna go off really steep. It's gonna go off to positive infinity. So I'll put my little infinity sign there. So part B is to identify any horizontal asymptotes in the graph. And I do have a horizontal asymptote. It's right here. And that is the line y equals zero. Remember, y equals something gives us this horizontal line here. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. This exponential function is gonna get really, really close, but never actually cross or touch that line. All right, go ahead and pause your video player now and answer practice question five. All right, question five. So here's our function, f of x equals one half x to the x power. Now, since this base is smaller than one, this is gonna be an exponential decay function. So we're gonna start out big and then get real small here. So let's see, let's see, when we put a negative three in there, we'd have this, f of negative three equals one half to the negative third power. Notice to get rid of this negative third power, I'm gonna have to take the reciprocal of the base here. So really what I have is two over one to the now the positive third power. Well, this is two over one is the same thing as two, so that would be two to the third power, which is gonna give me eight. So when I put a negative three in there, I get a positive eight for my value. Let's see, f of negative two, it's gonna be the same thing. One half to the negative second power, we flip it, take it to the positive power. Two to the second power is just gonna give us four. Now if I put zero up here, any base to the zero power is just gonna give me one. If I put a one up here, one half to the first power is just gonna be one half. When I put a two up here, I'd be squaring this, meaning one half times one half, which would give me one fourth. And then when I put a three up here, I would have one half times one half times one half, which is gonna give me one eighth. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot these points. At negative three, I was already off my graph. I was way up here, let's say maybe up here at, at eight. At, at negative two, I had the value of four. At zero, I had a value of one. And at one, one half. And at two, one fourth. And at three, one eighth. And so you can see my graph is gonna be curving in like this. And again, we're never gonna quite reach this line here. Whoops. So as I come down, I'm gonna get close to, but never cross the x-axis here. So identify any horizontal asymptotes in the graph. So here's my horizontal asymptote, it's right there. Again, it's this line, y equals zero, is my horizontal asymptote. Okay, go ahead and pause your video player now and answer practice question six. Okay, so here we're gonna graph this equation, f of x equals two to the x power minus three. So let's see. When we put a negative three into this guy, I'll have f of negative three. Okay, so I'm gonna have two, two to the negative third power. Let's adjust that a little bit. So really what that is is one half then to the third power minus three. Well, one half to the third power is gonna give me one eighth. And one eighth minus three, well, let's see. I have to get a common denominator, so let's see, I'll write three over one. Then I would have to multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by eight to get a common denominator of eight. So really what I'm gonna have here is I'm gonna have one eighth minus uh, 24 eighths. So that's gonna give me negative 23 eighths. That's my fraction there, negative 23 eighths. All right, when I put a negative two in here, I'm gonna have two to the negative second power minus three. Well, two to the se negative second power is actually gonna give me the fraction one fourth minus three. Let's 
So I have wrote 3 as a fraction. Now I'm getting a common denominator. It'll be 1 fourth. My missing multiplier here is going to be 4, so that's going to give me 12 fourths. So it's actually going to give me negative 11 fourths when I evaluate that one. Okay, 0, when I put 0 into the equation, it's going to be 2 to the 0 power. Well, 2 to the 0 power is just 1. Any number to the 0 power is 1, so 1 minus 3 is going to give me negative 2 for that value. When I put a 1 up here, it's going to be 2 to the first power, so that'll give me the value of 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. When I put a 2, put a 2 in here, 2 to the second power is 4. 4 minus 3 is going to give me 1. When I put a 3 up here, 2 to the third power is 8. 8 minus 3 is 5. So let's take a look at these uh, values now. It looks like as we get small, we're approaching. Well, let's look at this graph these values, and then we'll start to talk about what's going to happen when we get small or big here. So negative 3, negative 23 eighths. Let's look at this as a mixed number. So this is going to be 2 and 7 eighths. Negative 2 and 7 eighths. This one is going to be uh, 2, sorry, negative 2, 2 and 3 fourths. So negative 2 and 7 eighths. So negative 3, negative 2 and 7 eighths. That's down 1, 2, almost 3. 7 eighths is almost 3. So we're getting real close right there. Then when we put a negative, so negative 2 and 3 fourths then. Negative 2, negative 2 and 3 fourths. So negative 2. Negative 2 down, 1, 2, 2 and 3 fourths. Not quite as low as 7 eighths. Then 0, we're going to get negative 2 itself. And then 1, we're going to get negative 1. And then 2, we're going to get positive 1. 3, we're going to get 5, so over 3, up 5. You can see our graph is going to go just like this. So this is exponential growth. And when we're coming down here, you can see our asymptote is going to be right here. Because what's going to happen is this thing gets real small. It's going to get really close to this line, but never cross it. And this line is the line y equals negative 3. Notice it's a horizontal line, and we want it to go through at negative 3. So there's our horizontal asymptote for practice question 6. Evaluate natural exponential functions. The natural exponential function f of x equals e to the x has the number e as the base. Just like pi, e is a decimal number that goes on forever without a pattern. So we use a symbol to represent it. There'd be no way to say this number without a symbol because it's a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal number. So we use symbols when we cannot state the number. So notice, here's our number pi, e, 2.718288827. It goes on and on and on. Same thing with pi. It goes on and on and on. And so we have these numbers. And so depending on how accurate you need to be, you take these decimal places out further. So if we're just in class here and we're just doing some estimations, we're probably not going to take the decimals out very far. But if we were actually doing a study and a scientific report, we would take this, this E number out all the way out. So these numbers, both E and pi, are kind of, they occur naturally in life. So we found these numbers over time looking at things. You know, pi came from a circle. That's where we got that number. E comes from when we study population growth and population decays. This number keeps popping up over and over again. So the natural exponential function is used to model many real life situations. And E is called the natural base because it occurs so frequently in nature. So what we're going to do here in practice question 7 is we're going to use this natural, uh, natural function here, natural exponential function with the letter E in it to calculate the gray wolf population for the Western Great Lakes region. So go ahead and pause your video player now and answer uh, practice question 7 and when you're done hit play to see how you did. Question 7. In 1978 the gray wolf was declared an endangered species and the Federal Protection Program. So the gray wolf population the gray wolf population in the Western Great Lakes region has since rebounded since it got put on the endangered species list. The natural exponential function f of x equals 1066 e to this power 0.042x models the gray wolf population where x is the years after 1978. So hopefully you recognize that. We don't want to just enter the number like 1979 or 1980 in there. x is going to be the years after 1978. So fill in the chart to create a graph to see how much the wolf population grew under the Federal Protection Program until 2008 
when they were removed from the endangered species list. So let's come down here and look at this graph, okay? So in 1978, that would be x is zero years. We're going to put zero in here and notice we'd have e to the zero power. Well, anything to the zero power is just one. So I'd have one times 1,066. Well, that's just going to give me 1,066. So in 1978, that's how many wolves there were, 1,066. In 1983, which is five years later, we're now going to put a five up in here for x. So I would take five times 0 0.042 and get that answer, which would give me uh, 0.21. So here's what my equation would look like then. I'd have f of 5 in this case is 1066 e to the 0 0.21 power. So what I want to do now is I want to hit uh, e to the x. You should have an e to the x key on your calculator. So find that e to the x key. You might have to use an inverse or a second function to find it. So I'm going to find e to the x now. And I'm going to take that to, oh, sorry. First thing on my calculator I do is I hit the number, 0.21. And then I hit e to the x. And then I don't want to round anything here. And I want to take that number times 1,066. So in 1983, we had 1,000. 315. Now, with these answers here, anytime we're talking about like wolves or people or animals or something like that, we want to round to the nearest whole number. So that's what I did there. All right. In 1988, that's going to be 10 years later. I'm going to take uh, 0 0.042 times 10. Get that answer. And now I'm going to take that e to the x and then times 1066 is going to give me 1,622.41. So we'll just have 1,622. Now, if you were having some mistakes here on this, and now you've heard me talk through it, go ahead and pause your video player now and see if you can get these last four. And then hit play to see how you did. OK, so go ahead and check out the values here and see if you came up with, some, with these numbers that you calculated. So this model right here would be very valuable to scientists. So they've probably gotten this model from other previous experiments where they've reintroduced wolf populations and put them on the endangered species list. So what a scientist would do is they could use this model and also go out into the, into the Western Great Lakes region and sample and study some of the wolf populations and try to get an estimate of populations early on to see if the model was correct, correctly predicting the number of wolves in the region. So if they started out in these first couple years and this model was spot on, they would continue to use this model all the rest of the way through. Now if they came out in the first couple years and this model was a little bit off, they would tweak the model, maybe change some of the numbers up here, uh, this expo exponential number here, and to adjust it to the wolf population and then use it to move forward. But this is very a, a nice advantage for them because now they can predict what the wolf population is going to be in 2008 and in the future. And so you can see in 2008, we were all the way back up to almost 4,000 wolves in the region. So they figured, OK, that's enough. Now we can take them off the endangered species list. Next thing we want to do here is graph. And so anytime we make a graph, we want to make sure our independent variable is going down here on the bottom and our dependent one goes on the side. So what we have here is we have time, and then we have the number of wolves in the region. Well, time is going to be our independent variable here, so we want to put that on the bottom. So let's see, we have to span 30 years. So I'm looking at my graph here, I want to span 30 years. So let's see, maybe if I did uh, every five years here, I could go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. That would make a pretty tight and small graph. So maybe if I go um, every two is five, then I'd go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, that seems pretty good. So every two of them, I'll do five years. Now, I don't want to write five on here. I want to write the years, the actual years. It's a span of, of years. So I'd write 1978. And then over here, two more. I'd write 1983. Two more. 1988. Okay, so I've got the years labeled down here. You might have drawn yours out a little bit further if you wanted to. If you win every three was the five years. Either way, as long as we get their model consistent and the spacing is even. Notice every two spots on my graph here is five years. All right, then over here we want to talk about the wolf population. And we want this wolf population 
to go to span from basically uh, maybe 0 to 3,000 so that we don't compress this graph. We want to go 0 to 3,000. So let's see. Maybe counting by um, every 2 is 1,000. So that'd be 1,000, 2,000. Now we can go even more than that. Let's do um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Every 5 is 1,000. So this will be 1,000. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That'll be 2,000. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That'll be 3,000. Okay, let's see what kind of graph we're trying to make here. It doesn't specify. Um, what type of graph? So you could, I think, appropriate graph here would be either either be a um, a bar graph or a line graph. I'm going to use a line graph because I think that's usually what somebody might use in this situation. But a bar graph is is fine as well. So in 1978, I'm supposed to come up with 1,066 wolves. So maybe somewhere right in here. And then in 1983, 1,315. Well, if I break this down. Um, this was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so halfway right there would be 1,500. So it looks like each of these are about 200. So I would say, okay, 200, 4, 6, 8, yeah, they're each 200. So on this next one in 1983, here would be 1,200. There would be 1,400, so I want to go somewhere in between there. So right about there. In 1988, I have uh, 1,600 basically. So here's 12, 14, 1600. In 1993, I have 2000, basically. So just a little bit over 2000. 98, I have almost 2500. So almost halfway up here in 1998. And then in 2003, I have 3046. So coming up here, 3,046 right in there. And then in 2008, I have, oh my gosh, 37. So almost 4,000. So let's see, one, uh, 32, 34, 36. So somewhere right in here, 2,000. So you can see when I graph this guy, this is exponential growth because you can see it curving upward as this wolf population is growing. And so you can see that's why they took them off the list in 2008 because this is growing exponentially and you can see that the wolf population is really starting to grow quite a bit. So they were thinking we don't want to get this too big here or the wolf population might get out of control. So that gives you a nice idea how somebody might use an exponential model here. What we've done is we've modeled this wolf population. Uh, a scientist might use this model to predict how many wolves, how long they need to keep the wolves on the endangered species list, and when, and when it's time to pull them off of the endangered species list so that we don't get too many of them in the region.